So here's, here's what we're doing today. It's, it's, it's very different, okay? Uh, number one, as you can see, I've got Elmo set up, which we're going to use him here in just a minute. Not right now. We've got a lot of things to get into. You also notice from your handout that you received today, you've got ten and a half pages of notes. And, the here, here, and here's the interesting thing is I let Mary read them before I print them, and she told me it was too much. And so I actually whittled about a page off of the notes. But here's the thing. I just simply cannot let something go. And, and I will tell you this, that if you are in the hermeneutics class, by the way, we have over 75 people taking the hermeneutics class on Mondays. Whoa. Hello, God. That's amazing. Um, can we bring me down just a little bit? Thank you, sir. Um, we have over 75 people taking the hermeneutics class. Uh, one thing I want you to take about these notes, if you don't ever grab any other notes that I have, please take these notes. And the reason is, is because when we're talking about what it is to interpret the text, I want you to see here that when we're dealing with a certain genre in the Bible, which is parables, we are going to be asking the question, what did Jesus mean when he said this? And you've got to have biblical evidence for the reason why you believe what you believe about what Jesus said. Parables are simple. Parables are easy to read. They are not so easy to interpret. There's a lot that goes into it. And if your interpretation gets off base, your application is going to be way out in left field. Okay? So, uh, with that in mind, if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me open to Matthew 13. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, we're probably not going to get through all of this today. It's probably not going to happen. Which I'm praying to the Lord that he would give me an application right at the time that I need it. Because my plan was to get through it all today. We'll see, right? The great thing is we'll all see each other at the end of the sermon, right? That's the good thing. Does so everybody have a pen? I have one extra. Everybody have a pen? Who needs a pen? I promise I won't throw it. I'll actually come hand it. Okay, great. Oh, okay. Excellent. Thanks, man. Does everybody have a paper? Does everybody have a chart? Everybody has a chart. Excellent. Everybody's good. Great. Susan, you don't have a chart? Oh, okay. Jim doesn't have a chart. Thank you. Excellent. Here we go. Now, let's talk about where we've been. Everything that we have been talking about since I got here is laying the foundation for who is God, what is man and woman, and what is sin. And the reason why we need to know that, and you've heard me say it over and over, until we know who God is and until we know who man is and until we know what sin is, we will not be able to properly understand the God-man who takes away the sins of the world. It is impossible we cannot just start in the New Testament and throw Jesus out there. He is too easily classified in the file cabinet of many other sacred beliefs that people hold. And unless they have a foundational framework planted around him in order to interpret him properly, he will often be misinterpreted. Now, one of the greatest things that we have seen is the chief end of God's plan for history is not salvation. Salvation plays a major, integral part in his plan. But it is not the chief end-all, be-all. The chief end-all, be-all is his glory. God will be glorified above all things, and salvation is only one little slice in the trivial pursuit pie of theology, okay? Okay? So in doing that, as we've been moving forward and seeing, we find that Jesus comes to a crux in his ministry where he is in confrontation with the Pharisees, and this is in chapter 12. Now there's some things I want to show you real quick just to touch on this as we go through. It's just important that we touch on it, okay? If you would, take a look at chapter 12, verse 28. And I cannot overemphasize this because... In verse 24 of chapter 12, the Pharisees commit the unpardonable sin. And what is that? By 
Christ being in the flesh, the promised Messiah of which they know the Old Testament inside and out, and he is doing mighty miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit that testify to who he is. The Gospel of John tells us the miracles are one of the witnesses that testify to who he is. They claim that the source of his miracles in casting out demons and healing people is actually derived from Satan. This sets Jesus off. And he gives an argument about how inconsistent and ludicrous this argument is. And what you find is, it's not that the Pharisees don't believe Jesus. We actually find out that what it probably is, is that they know who he is, but they are unwilling to release their stranglehold that they have on the Jewish people through religion and legalism. They would much rather hold the bar over their head rather than let them experience the promised king. The major testimony that Jesus gives, chapter 12, verse 28, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. What is the offer? that Jesus gives. Chapter 4 of Matthew, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. One chapter before, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ himself, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In fact, he tells them, make straight the paths of the Lord. We find out later from Paul in Acts 19, why did John say that? So that when Jesus showed up, they would not miss him that they would believe in the one who was to come. And if you remember, the Pharisees came out, and they wanted to see what John was doing. And remember his whole way how to win friends and influence people? You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee the wrath that is to come? But bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Notice he is calling them, Change your mind and get your life in alignment with it. Think differently about these situations. John was experiencing a mini revival out in the wilderness. And they had to come and see what it was. Then if you remember, we fast forwarded to Matthew 10. Jesus was deeply moved from the lostness. Everybody was without direction at the end of 9. And he turns around and he commissions the 12 to go out. Do not go to the Samaritans. Do not go to the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and tell them the kingdom of heaven is near. Over and over and over, the preaching of Jesus is about the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm going to say some things this Sunday and next Sunday that you may not agree with, okay? But thankfully, all of us have the word of God. And you are never to just take my word for it. Okay, hopefully you can see that I've studied on this, right? From the notes, yes, that everybody is going to raise their right hand and solemnly swear to read this week, right? Exactly. But in doing so, I encourage you to pray and to search through these things because I want to, I want to uh, not lead you mis- astray, I promise you. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. And we're going to go slow for the sake of setting up the scene. That day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And that might be the only verse we get through today. I don't know. On the same day. Now, here's the interesting thing about Matthew. Because Matthew's gospel is written in such a way as to defend the subject of the kingdom. And probably the question that was mainly asked is, well, well, it was promised that Jesus would sit on David's throne before he was ever even conceived in Mary's womb. What happened with him dying on a cross? And, and, And where's this kingdom that we were promised? What's going on with that? And so Matthew is laying this out. But the interesting thing about Jewish thought is that Jewish thought thinks more in pictures and events, not so much in chronology. 
And so chances are some of the things that we're going to see are not chronologically in line. However, here we have some interesting chronology that is put in front of our faces. Number one, that day. Here's a question, just from what we've read, just from what we've covered. If you missed it, you're now obligated to go on the website and listen to all the previous stuff about number 12. What's up? Another sheet? Where were you when we passed them out? I'm just kidding. Awesome. It's Roger's fault. Okay. It's Roger Kimberly. He lives at... No, I'm just kidding. That day, from what we've studied, what do you think that day is? What was the last major event that happened? Well, his mother and brothers were outside asking for him, and if you remember, he made an interesting statement. He said, those who do the will of my father... That is my mothers and brothers. Now, I don't know about you, but isn't it interesting? Does everybody see the shift that's taking place here? Once the leaders of Israel speak for the nation, and they set the nation on a course of anti-belief, they know that Jesus is the Messiah, but they refuse to believe him. So it's not just unbelief, it's anti-belief. That's important. In doing so, Jesus' ministry changes. And if you remember, he said no sign is going to be given to this evil and adulterous generation except the sign of Jonah. The Son of Man is going to be three days and three nights in the the heart of the earth, just like Jonah was in the belly of a great sea monster. That is going to be the sign that I'm going to give them. Jesus had never spoken of his death or his resurrection before up until this point. Very interesting. So notice, that day, the same day that all these events went down and took place, Jesus makes a statement, and we may miss it. Look what it says. Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Now, is this what Jesus literally did? Yes. He was in a house meeting with some people. He got up, opened up the door, went outside, and he sat down next to water. You're like, so what? Right? I'm unimpressed, Jeremy. Tell me. Do me a favor. Look back real quick in chapter 12 at verse 29. And this confrontation that he has, it says, or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? Jesus was using this to show his power over Satan. Satan had the house on lockdown. Jesus comes in, ties up the strong man, Satan, and starts plundering the house, setting people free. Does everybody see that? I'm like, okay, I'm not convinced. Okay, that's fine. How about verse 44? Turn over to 44. Remember, this is the demon that is cast out of a man, passes through waterless places seeking rest, does not find it. Verse 44, then it says, I will return to my what? My house from which I came. And when it comes, I will find it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Now stop. Does everybody realize that the man in 43 and the man in 44 is a word picture that Jesus is using to talk about Israel? Isn't that right? Weren't they coming out in a baptism of repentance? Remember, we talked about that. John would put his hand on their head, put them under the water, they'd pop up and they would start confessing the things that they had done wrong. And why was that? So that the paths were made straight to receive the Messiah when he showed up on the scene. If this is your first time here, I apologize. You got to have some, some tread work to go with this, right? But notice what he says. When the house was cleared and vacant, it was now time to receive the Messiah. But when the demon comes back and sees, hey, nobody's taking up residence here. And so what happens? 45, then it goes. Takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first, and watch Jesus' application here, because he ties it up. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation is he talking about men and houses and things or is he talking about that generation of israel everybody see it now watch does jesus literally get up and walk out of a house and sit down by sea yes he does but he's also trying to communicate something this is a symbol he is leaving the house 
and he is walking out by the sea. Now, if any of you in here are prophecy gurus, what does it mean, sea? How is sea often interpreted in Revelation and Daniel 7? Revelation 13, Revelation 17, 15, Daniel 7, 3 through 7? People. Well, not just people. Gentiles. Pagans. The nations is the idea. Notice that Jesus is communicating the turn in his ministry. He is stepping away from the house of Israel. Why? Because he rejected them? Well, he didn't reject them until they rejected him. In fact, we find in Romans 11 that the way that Paul communicates this is that the natural branches have now been broken off and those that weren't natural are going to be grafted in. And in Acts chapter 2, we're going to see a brand new entity that had never come about before. And there was no mention of it made before in the Old Testament. And this is what is known as what we have right now, the body of Christ, the church. And so Jesus' ministry is changing. It is moving. It is doing something different. And because Israel has already rejected him, his teaching now is going to be extremely specific in line with his audience, but also the interpretation that he reveals. I got 12 minutes. Here we go. <laughs> Verse 2. And the large crowds gathered to him, so he got into a boat and he sat down. Now, why does he sit down? If you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount or if you're familiar with Jewish culture, you would actually find, and I'm actually thinking we need to do this, that whenever a rabbi sat down to teach his students, he sat down and they stood up. So, uh, you've just forfeited the mic. All right. If we have to stand for Jesus, we're not having it. All right. So notice this. So he got into a boat, he sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. Now that's kind of neat, right? He goes out into the waters, and he's got nothing but a captive audience in front of him. And watch what happens here. Verse 3, and behold... Sorry, sorry, that's the next one. And he spoke, notice this, many things to them in parables. Everybody see that that's plural? Okay, remember, Matthew is writing back on events that took place. And so Matthew 13 is filled with eight different parables. Some people say seven, I see eight. Okay, there are eight different parables in here. And this is a teaching that he's going to give, and he's never spoken on parables before. Parables, from the Greek word parabole, it's the idea of casting alongside is what the two words mean in a compound word. It is a story that is cast alongside a truth in order to bring greater clarification for what Jesus is trying to communicate here. Now this is extremely important that you get this idea. A parable is much more than a metaphor. It's much more than that because the story tends to be pretty extended, and there's different facets to it. Some schools will say, well, you only want to get the one big idea out of the parable. Well, that's true. You never want to bypass that. But what we're going to see how Jesus interprets, well, we probably won't see his interpretation until next week. But when Jesus interprets this, we actually see that he makes mention and use of the details that he chooses to give. Now, with Elmo... Let's go ahead and get out our sheets so we can do this. And the reason why I want you marking through this is I want you to see, number one, this isn't hard to deal with if we will just take the time to deal with it. First, who is speaking? Jesus is speaking. So let's write his name up here. Jesus. Can everybody see that pretty good? There we go. Yeah, technology, it's finest, man. There we go, Jesus. Good. Who's his audience? No? It's actually Jews. He came out of the house and there's a large crowd. He hasn't. Here's the interesting thing. In Jesus' earthly ministry, he never traveled outside of Israel, except the time, well, when he was earlier gone to Egypt, but he wasn't ministering at that point when he was a baby when he fled because of Herod. But in his ministry, he was Galilee, Samaria, Judea. That's it. He never went out of there. He never vacationed in Africa. He never went. His whole ministry was right there for that entire four years. Deal with that one later, right? So notice, the audience is Jewish in nature, okay? Now here we go. Behold, verse 3, the sower went out to sow. 
And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Here's what we got. As far as the parable contents here, notice this. What is the verse? It's 13.4, right? So we're going to put verse 4. And here's what we know. The seed fell beside the road. You didn't know you were coming to study the Bible today, did you? Good stuff. That's tongue-in-cheek. I apologize. And the birds came up and ate them, right? Birds eat the seed. This is important. Two major points about this. Is that pretty clear? With the exception of my chicken scratch handwriting. So that's number one. It's parable number one. Now that, that's the first part of this parable. The whole thing's one parable, but that's the first facet of this first parable. Verse five. Others fell on rocky places. Okay? So notice rocky places. Look what it says where they did not have much soil, and immediately they spring up because they had no depth of soil. Now, probably going to have to utilize your space here, but let's go ahead and handle verse 5, because it is also into verse 6 as well. So rocky places, not much soil. Immediate response. So I actually had to uh, text with Carol about this because I was like, plant-wise, what's going on here? And she informed me. Let's read verse 6. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Here's what she told me. The heat causes the seed to germinate quickly. But without a solid root laid down deep into good soil, there are no nutrients to sustain it. Thus, the presence of the sun goes beyond helping to hurting. Very interesting. So notice, because no root is able to draw off of anything from the ground to keep it going, it's just receiving the UV from the sun. Help, 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 and all of a sudden it starts to hurt it. Does everybody see how that works? Interesting. So let's include our information about number six. Sun, very good word, scorches. That's hell. No, it's not. It scorches the plant, no root, and it withered away. Time to have five minutes. We can get through this. Everybody good? Okay, verse 7. It's the third part of this. Others fell among the thorns. Thorns, right? Verse 7, thorns. The thorns came up and choked them out. Some people believe this was brambles in the Middle East. There's brambles there that would have choked these things out. Um, Let's see here. Uh, In fact, we could do this. Thorns spring up. Plant is choked. And let's do choked out because that sounds more wrestling, right? There we go. Because that's a theological reason to make a decision like that, right? The next one, verse 8. The last one, move Elmo. My bad. There we go. How's that? Verse 8. The others fell on good soil. And it yielded a crop. There is produce to be had. And notice, you've got a hundredfold, you've got sixtyfold, you've got thirtyfold. And I think this is important to put maybe at the end if you want to give like a star or something. He who has ears. Are you here today and have ears? Yes, let him hear. Notice what it says. Let him hear. 
In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. Pay attention and respond. I'm going to leave that up there so that you can look at it. I'm going to go ahead and give you some things because we will deal more interactively with these soils next week when we're able to give the interpretation. But look at verse 10. And the disciples and came and said to him, sorry, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Now notice that the question that the disciples ask is in the plural, correct? So chances are Matthew is not following strict chronological order here. This was probably after the fact, and here's the reason why. If you take your Bible and look over at verse 36, chapter 13, verse 36, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and look at the next part, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field, which we'll deal with in two weeks. So notice when he leaves the crowds, he comes in off the boat, he goes right back into the house, And now his disciples come and he has a private conversation with them. Chances are, verse 36 is where verse 10 took place. Matthew probably includes it here so that we, the readers, are not left in the dark about what's going on. The first question to ask is, Jesus, why are you teaching in this way? Now stop. When he asks that question, what does that automatically tell you? What's that? He hasn't done it before. Jesus, you're a great teacher. Man, I mean, I've passed Theology 101 and 102 with you. It's going great. But I'm having a real hard time with Parables 390, right? This is a doctorate level course that you got me going through here. What in the world do you mean? We've never heard you say this before. Now, notice it's not necessarily about confusion of the content, which Jesus is going to explain. It's the method that Jesus is using. And it's important to see why it is taking place. Jesus answered them. Now stop. Who is them? Disciples. This is going to help you huge. You, them, they. Mark these in your Bible. Okay? Watch this. Jesus answered them. And well, here's what I've done. I've put a little number one next to them, and I've written disciples next to it. Okay? Everybody see my little chicken scratch on there. Can you bring that up? Show it. Whoa. There you go. Everybody, uh, let's see, right there. Disciples. Everybody see that? Okay. Good deal. That's what my Bible looks like, guys. Why is your Bible so clean? I don't understand. Mine's actually got coffee spots and stuff, but that's okay. So, notice, Jesus answered them, to you, who's you? Disciples, to you it has been granted. This word in the Greek, didomai, it is to grant something or to furnish it or to give this to them. It's been given to you, is the idea, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, who's them? The Jewish crowd, notice that. The Jews who have rejected him. To them it has not been granted. Granted. Now, I think this is important. Number one, what is the content of his parable before you ever move forward? What does Jesus plainly tell you? What is the content? It's about agriculture. Well, that's what he's using to paint the picture, but what does he tell you? To you, it has been granted what? To know what? The mysteries. Of the kingdom of heaven. Stop. Has Jesus been offering the kingdom of heaven since the beginning of Matthew? Did the prophets talk about the kingdom that was to come all throughout in order to try to encourage the people to forsake the idols that they had and to turn from their wicked ways and turn unto a living God so that they would live? In Ezekiel 18, don't we see things like, why would you die? Turn and live. Because the only way to truly live in life is in obedience to the Savior. It is a living that we have never been able to tap into, no matter how sophisticated society becomes. Isn't this the same kingdom that was promised to David that one would sit on his throne and it would be everlasting dominion? Yes. This is the same kingdom that we see at the end of Daniel chapter 2, a kingdom that is made without hands that comes in and destroys all other man-made kingdoms. This is not a different kingdom. The problem is, is the Pharisees missed it by not accepting the king. That's the problem. 
And so now those who have accepted the king are going to receive greater revelation about it. But it has not been granted to the crowds anymore. Now watch what happens here. Verse 12, he sums us up. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. Who are the ones in this who have? The disciples. They're the ones who accepted. Those are the ones who responded to the presence of the king. But notice what it says after that. Whoever has more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. I don't know who you are, but an abundance is always a good thing, unless it's trouble. Or Chicago Bears memorabilia. Which, I know you're wearing your Packers stuff today. I'm proud of you. I'm telling you, Pastor Steve's going to repent one of these days. So moving on. But notice what it says. But whoever does not have, who are the ones who do not have? The Jewish crowds. Notice that. Those that do not have, look what it says. Even what he has shall be taken away from him. Whatever grasp they think they have on these things, gone. Now watch this. Verse 13, therefore, what's that therefore? You are all studious hermeneutes. Thank you so much. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because, here's the reason, while seeing, they do not see. Were there crowds out there on the shore? Were they looking at Jesus? So much so that he had to get away from them in order to have some room. They were mobbing him. They were crowding him. And he had to get back so he could teach them all. They saw him, but notice when he teaches, they're not seen. Notice this, while they were hearing, did they hear what he said? Yeah, but they do not hear. Nor do they, there's the key word here, they don't understand what he's saying. Now watch this, in their case, whose case? The Jewish crowds, so mark that. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, present day fulfillment in Jesus's time that prophecy is being fulfilled at that very moment and what is this prophecy Jesus watch what happens here you will keep on hearing but will not understand you will keep on seeing but will not perceive now here's the tragic part of it watch this verse 15 for the heart of this people has become dull Any of you know people whose hearts have just become dull to hearing the things of God? And it grieves us, doesn't it? Because we want better for them than what they want for themselves. And whatever relationship we have like that, Jesus' relationship with the Jewish people was far greater. How do we know that? What does Paul tell us in Romans 9? To them belongs the patriarchs. Belongs the law of God, belongs all this revelation, belongs all this exposure to divine things, and they are not believing. Sometimes we throw our hands up, we go, what more evidence does this person need? It's an issue of the heart. It's always with God an issue of the heart. God doesn't really care much about externals. When we went to go do that baptism and I came walking out of my office with my swim shorts on, some of you looked at me like, who are you and what did you do with our pastor? (laughs) I saw your looks. I saw your judgments. Lord knows your heart, right? But no, seriously, externals, he's not so much worried about. Why is that? Because God loves people. and God's after the heart. He's always been after the heart. He's always been after the heart. But these people cannot receive anymore what Jesus desperately wants to show them and bring to them and usher in a time like they have never known before, reigning as their king there on earth. Instead, they accredited his acts to the devil. It's the heart. He says here, with their eyes, they or sorry, with their ears, they scarcely hear. They have closed their eyes. Notice. 
Personal responsibility. They've rejected revelation. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart. Notice that. Understand with their heart. That's the reason. And what's it say? Return. And that's what he wanted. And in fact, before he teaches on the end times, Matthew chapter 23, 39, Israel, or sorry, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how badly, how desperately I wanted to gather you to myself as a mother hen gathers her chicks under its wing and you were not willing. Mercy, 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 mercy. I don't know how God is pouring out mercy towards you or showing you things about himself, but it is tragic to let our hearts become so dull that we do not respond. And this is a situation he is dealing with here. He wants to tell them glorious things about the end of time when he rules supreme, and they won't have it. Let's finish this up. Verse 16, but blessed are your eyes. Why? Who's your? Disciples. Blessed are your eyes. Why? Because they see in your ears, because they hear. For truly I say to you, the disciples, many prophets... And righteous men desired to see what you see, right? That's called the Old Testament is what that is. They desired to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Is that true? What did they desire to hear and see? And it never came about in their lifetime. Turn with me to Hebrews 11. Let's finish here. Sorry, Mitch, I'm throwing you a curveball. I'm praying that this is the leading of the Holy Spirit to wrap this up because I'm just going to forfeit Sunday school and go for it, but never mind. (laughs) What is Hebrews 11? It's the faith chapter. But what is the end culmination of that faith of everyone recorded? Do we know that they went to heaven when they died? No. No. And I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for you. That is not what the parable of the soils is about. It is not three go to hell, one is truly saved. And it's not one goes to hell and the other three are truly saved. It is all of them are believing. Otherwise, the seed would not be coming their way because it represents truth about the kingdom that is being scattered around and it has to deal with the responses to that message. And that's what we're going to deal with next week. Chapter 11 of Hebrews, look what it says. Yeah, chapter 11, look at verse 9. This is talking about Abraham. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the promise. Notice it's using inheritance language. It is using possessive language, things that they would receive because they had followed God there. Now stop. Is Abraham already saved at this point? Yeah, Abraham believed God and it was credited him as righteous. We don't have a problem there. But look at the next part. It tells us what he was going for. For he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. You say, what? What city did God build? It's not Jerusalem. What is it? Do we know? It's the kingdom. They were looking for the kingdom. They were looking for a time when God would come in and establish his righteous rule and all sin would be squelched. That's what they were looking for. How about moving on down? Let's see here. Let's go all the way down to, um, oh, good grief. We could hit it all. Um uh, is it 16? Yeah, I'm sorry. Look at, look at verse uh, 13. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. They were all looking for them, but they died without receiving them. Look what it says. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. In other words, they recognized that they didn't live here and they didn't belong here. 
There's something else that needed to be happening, and that's why they are square pegs and round holes. It says here, four, those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly country. One, therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. In rejecting Jesus, what did the Jews reject? The king. And in rejecting the king, you are rejecting his kingdom. And so now they they have rejected. Jesus is pulling back, and he is teaching in such a way, and if you want to know what your final little blank down, or your, your second blank down here is, Uh, the purpose of the parables. The purpose of the parables, they are teachings of judgment against the Jewish people. Why? Because even though they hear what he's saying, they're not understanding what's going on. Because even though they see it, they're still blind to the fact of what he is there to do. But it is also, in juxtaposition of that, a revealing of greater truths to the disciples who had accepted him. Now, here's here's what you're saying. I know. Lord, I'm trying desperately to understand what this southern boy is trying to tell me. And I can't figure it out. It's because we don't have the time to dive into all of it. And I don't have a great application for you today, but I will tell you this. Reception of God's revelation is paramount to your existence and vitality, period. Whatever we think that we're settling for on this earth and somehow it is separated from God, I tell you this, it's sin. Regardless of how much we love it, regardless of how much society has told us it is good or it's bad, if it is not of God, it is wrong. And the problem is, is the Jewish leaders wanted to hold on to the good, and in doing so, they forsook the great. They loved having the power, but they disregarded the divine revelation of the Lord. Now, everybody raise your right hand. I solemnly swear. Oh, you, come on now. I solemnly swear that I will be here next Sunday and I will re-listen to this sermon online. Put your hand back up. And I will read all 11 and a half pages of notes so that Jeremy does not look like a total fool for not being able to get through all of his sermon. Go ahead. Sadly, I expect nothing less from this bunch. All right, let's pray. God, I pray that our hearts are provoked to read through Matthew 13. And to see that Jesus is pronouncing judgment upon a people who have rejected him. But he is showing things to people who have accepted him that they would have never understood before. He is showing them things that are previously unrevealed, brand new things about his coming kingdom. Father, maybe we don't live for that. Maybe notice, no one told us that we needed to live for that. To live for the day when we see your righteous rule. To live for the day when we are gathered unto you. And we will be with you always. Maybe our motivation needs to be changed. Maybe our goals and priorities are out of line just with seeing what Jesus has said here. You are gracious in giving us many, many chances to respond. But there will come a day when grace will run out. When it will then be a time for judgment. And we can't afford to apologize for that or shy away from that because it's what the Word clearly teaches. You have been so gracious and loving in giving us your Son But he said, when he is lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. You've given the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And you have promised a great and glorious end. So 
So, Father, if there are any of us here who do not know you, I pray, God, today that be rectified. Just reflecting on a simple verse, you love the world, you gave your Son, and whoever believes in him will not perish but has everlasting life. So, Father, let us glory in you and boast in you and say thank you, God, that because we have accepted Jesus, you have given us the opportunity to understand these mysteries. We ask you in the name of our Savior. Amen.